Welcome everyone to another episode of Voices with Raveki. I'm really pleased to be here with Iris Stamberger. So um, Iris reached out to me by an email and she said, John, I'm, I'm making use of a lot of your work in work I'm doing called the Wisdom Project. And I said, well, that sounds really interesting. Um, and then we met, uh, you know, um, not recorded and we had a conversation and I was uh, really impressed with Iris. And uh, as soon, I think it was only even when we were just halfway in, I said, I really want you to come on with Voices with Raveki and talk about the Wisdom Project and talk about how you're making use of my work and your work and what your work is doing and, and how it builds on work you used to be doing and, uh, and all that sort of thing. So Iris, uh, welcome. Okay, thank you, John. Again, thank you, thank you, thank you for your work. It's helping me. You know, Greg Hernandez said, you're giving me the concepts to understand why I think what I think. So I would ascribe to that comment by Greg. It's really wonderful. In my case, I have been looking since I was a teenager for tools for transformation, for metanoia, because I used to be very Catholic and I was trained by the Jesuits right. in Venezuela. Uh, in, with the work of Taylor de Chardin, who right. was a Jesuit uh, priest who got defrocked because his ideas about evolution and improvement and the here. So that kernel of knowledge has guided me throughout my life. And um, I became an engineer and um, I mod modeled systems. And, um, you know, the systems always change. So that change in the human, the change in the uh, mechanical systems that we modeled as engineers also led me to think of how to change uh, work systems, uh, communities. Of practice communities of work and so i have been creating systems and the last one um, was the product of me going back to school and getting a phd with daniel dennett at tufts university nearby i live in the boston area and david Feldman, who is a cognitive developmental psychologist whose specialty is transitions mm -hmm. and i have been always interested what is that happens when you take you know, one person from here to here, and psychology has the concept of the zone of proximal development okay, and the internalization true. of the coach or the teacher or the knowledge. But, you know, for me, it's like, how do I take this person, you know, it's more than just a zone of proximal development. Right. So I found this uh, philosopher, I love her, her work, Ruth Milliken, yes. who has this idea of push me, pull you representations. Yeah, it's yeah, like yeah, the yeah. Janus face in the Rome um, pantheon of gods that has two faces that takes you from, you know, like to a transitional state. So that's kind of my life quest. <laughs> I have done it in different modalities and the uh, pragmatic framework that I created by going back to school led me to go to many universities in Latin America and some in Europe because I was lucky to sign with a group in Harvard who helps universities. So the method, I managed to teach teachers how to use it to change the way they work and then train others. I train facilitators. So many people got trained into that. And I've been doing that for about 12 years um, here in the Boston area with different companies but um, I could never do it the way I did it when I started with Harvard because I don't have that type of leverage. So people buy pieces and here and there of the framework. And so I found your work. Mm. And I thought initially, but I failed, that your four levels of knowledge, the um, participatory, perspectival, uh, procedural, and propositional were related to the way I approach a system, right. a complex system. Right. Uh, in, in, <laughs> in systems engineering, there is this tool called cognitive work analysis. Right. And right. you take a complex system where people interact with each other and with objects and there are cognitive processes and you do certain type of analysis. The first one is you analyze the domain. And because it's complex, you layer the domain. Right, right. right so right. I was trying to map <laughs> the way I layer a domain and with your four levels of knowledge. 
it really was difficult. I didn't succeed. I still try every day. <laughs> so, but um, even though I couldn't use that yet, I have not been able to benefit from that approach, which I hope I understand. I was able to then finally find a way to do my work for the general public. Usually I go to, into an organization and people have a project and I help them with a bunch of tools from systems engineering, from organizational change, from quality management, a bunch of tools to get them from here to here. Right, right. And the specialty of the consultant is to really capture the zone of proximal development of a particular group to be able to sometimes in three months, sometimes during a weekend to take them from here to here. And that's what I have been doing. It's very um, focused work. You need to know um, the problem they have, not necessarily a domain. The domain is management. It's management of organizations. Um, but it's not something I could take to the general public. But when you said that it was a mistake to think of wisdom as expertise, wow, wow. So I have been looking about the development of, exp of expertise, the domain ex expertise. You know that in psychology, after Piaget, assimilation and accommodation, people fought against domain-specific development. Yes. And Professor Feldman from Tufts, he was a domain-specific person looking for the transition. So anyway, I was in that nine dot frame yeah. until I heard your video series. Wow. And listening to your video series, I felt, oh, I can do the same thing that I do my cognitive work analysis of a project and bring that to anybody, to, right. you know, to my neighbor, to the teacher in the high school, not only to people in corporations that pay consultants to do this type of transformational work. Right, 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 right. So right. Ergo, the, the wisdom project is one project at a time to bring wise reason right. to your life your family and your community. That's kind of the aim. That's so cool. That's so cool. Let me uh, let me just make sure people understand the topic you, you've mentioned. The zone of proximal development comes from Bogotsky. Uh, just very simply, here's what a child could learn on their own. <clears throat> here's what a child can learn with uh, uh, a teacher. And above that line, even with the teacher, the child can't learn. In between those, that's the zone of proximal development. And Bogotsky argued, <clears throat> that's where you do the best learning because you're not just solving the problem, you're internalizing the higher order perspective of the teacher, and that helps develop your metacognition and your ability to self-correct and self-transcend. That's why there's zone of proximal development. But what I hear you saying, Iris, is you know, that th there's a sense in which you want to understand that, but not in a domain-specific way, but in a much uh, more generalizable way. Well, because wisdom is a it's a transferable skill, it's a transferable virtue. It applies to everything you reason about. Yes, exactly. It's a, uh, foolishness and wisdom are not domain specific. Uh, they're domain general phenomena. So, exactly. well, so, so, so th this opened you up and you have been putting together like a, a program, the, uh, the wisdom project. Take us through it, walk us through it. What, what are its okay, components, so, what do people do, et cetera? Mm -hmm. I uh, chose from your definition as wisdom, as an ecology of practices slash cognitive styles. Right. Um, and then you list aspiration, transformation, intuition, internalization, yeah. um, et cetera, gnosis, understanding. I chose seven. Right. I chose aspiration and transformation aspiration in the developmental sense that Agnes Carter does it. Yes, 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 yes. Transformation in the revelatory sense that Lori Paul does it. L.A. Paul's amazing book. So oh, good man. Agnes Callard's good. book, Aspiration, blew my mind. Uh, I get to, I got to meet Lori. I went down, to, she invited me down to Yale to give a, a guest lecture there. 
Uh, her book is amazing, transformative experience. Keep going, keep going. Well, in the way that they both can agree to disagree without fighting each other. Yes, yes, there yes, is yes, a yes, lecture yes. they gave at the American Philosophical Association where they got a prize. It's difficult to see what the differences are, you know, but they are. One is the developmental, the other is not. Uh, you know, so I took those two because I have tools in my toolkit where I can invite people to visit those skills, right. to try to attain those skills. In the case of aspiration for this particular program that I'm running right now, I chose a few mindful communication tools. Mm. So right. people center in the being here and now instead of the there and then. Right. So mindful communication in the sense that, that is done in Vipassana, in, excuse me, a mindfulness uh, meditation in the sense that is done in authentic relating. So mm. mindfulness techniques, okay? Right, 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 right. And combine that, the mindfulness with what I call the Solomon paradox exercise. I transformed right. Igor Grossman. That's work, <laughs> yes, yes. So you try- you you Really, go are ahead. You, are, are you doing like, uh, so uh, just so people know, um, uh, recently was one among many people co-authored a paper uh, by Igor Grossman, the wisdom consensus paper. Um, but uh, Igor did work. Um, for example, the Solomon effect is if you ask people to describe a problem they're having, they'll describe it almost inevitably from the first person perspective and they'll be stuck. And then you ask them to re-describe it from a third person perspective and they'll often get an insight into uh, their problem. And that's by the way, what I mean when I say why the meta perspectival abilities, the perspectival knowing is so central to wisdom. So are you getting people to move in a perspectival manner? Uh, yeah, okay. That's and, and to offer their own, because it's a project-based learning approach, pedagogy. It's also an experiential pedagogy in the sense that they have to have experiences, but it's also peer teaching. Right, right. So offering the opportunity to people to contribute their wisdom and so people do the, the Solomon paradox, which is that Solomon used to be very wise in the history books, and he was really a wonderful king, but in his personal life, he was a mess. That's and stopped. apparently yeah. many people are like that. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Exactly. So um, people are being able to offer to others their own way of exper exper experiencing different perspectives. Right, 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 right. So, so that was, uh, really powerful. Uh, during the first uh, session, uh, the Wisdom Project introduction is done in seven weeks, two hours online every week. Right. And I cover the seven skills of wisdom, aspiration, transformation, mindfulness, open-mindedness, intuition, understanding, and self-regulation in the first six weeks. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and the last week, it's about preparing them to close and to implement the project. Right. To implement the project, which some of them already know what direction to go. Some of them already feel that they have made progress. Some of them feel that they have to review the project. So, so is this project, like, is it, is it, is it typically a personal project they're engaging in? They're, 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 they're engaging in a project of sort of uh, a, a personal change? Is that the type of project you're talking about? To, to register in the program, I ask for people to have a project and the project has to be personal, like self-care. Right. I need to develop this type of attitude towards my personal life or my personal right. fitness or whatever. Could be relational, could be, I need to improve my relational with this or that person, or could be an eat project. Uh, related to the world. Like I want to transform my teaching practice that my students love into assets, digital assets, assets that other students throughout the world can benefit from. You know, I have the three types of projects in the, in the class that I'm teaching right now. So in each one, they're learning a virtue um, and, and then you have like a set of practices or exercise they go through for mindfulness, for transformation, for aspiration, for active open-mindedness, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
So and I try. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Did, did do you uh, like? Did you find that, um, that there, there was a particular order of of doing them that worked the best? Um, like starting. Well, with this is this is the first time I'm running it. Ah. Um, I think I have changed my questions to you while I tried to meet you, but we couldn't. So now I'm about to teach the last session yeah. this Friday, yeah. the seventh class. But I used to think of that as the seven steps towards something, but that doesn't work like that. It's like uh, a dynamic. Right. Thing. Yes. You know, like, yes. Yes. Just, that's how it goes. That's ecology, an ecology of practice. It's yeah. an ecology. So, yeah. so I would like to have done the staircase, the like ladder thing, but it doesn't work like that. No. Um, and I chose aspiration because I love the model of development that it you affords. That. You mean you, cho you chose to start with aspiration? Yes, okay. and to finish with transformation. I start with Agnes and finish with Lori. <laughs> I wonder what Agnes and Lori would say about that. Uh, I <laughs> and in the process, I call you, I call you uh, the intellectual father of the Wisdom Project. Right. And I called Lisa Feldman Barrett, the intellectual mother. Oh, because Lisa is the woman from How Emotions Are Made. Right. And the idea that the brain is a prisoner in the school trying to make sense of what's going on outside and trying to predict. And because the type of people that I know and I attract and I think will come and have, have come to my different programs are highly self-regulated people with PhDs and papers and yeah, yeah. dual careers, MDs and PhDs, people like that. I think that self-regulation of the emotional aspect is vital. Right. And Lisa Feldman Barrett has a powerful way of describing the emotional landscape. Right, 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 right. In terms of, you know, uh, uh, two, two, two axes where you have higher arousal or low arousal, Right. And aversion, craving and aversion, you know, like the Buddhist model, yeah. either craving. So, and then from that, she says that everything else is cultural. And it's really nice for people to see that they can sculpt somehow their emotional lives. Right, right, it's right. Fascinating. Because I only have two hours every time I cannot talk, you know, and I need time for them to experience, time to share, et cetera. I cannot talk about snippets, but I try every every session to to include the vision of emotions that Lisa Feldman um, br br brings to the forefront. I've been arguing for quite a while that we should add to the four E's, uh, uh, like a fifth E, uh, which is cognition is inherently emotional, um, and uh, deeply convinced that that's the case. And I'd add a, a sixth E that. Cognition is exaptive. Uh, we take processes from sensory motor and we exact them into more abstract cognition. Um, yeah, the shaman, the shaman. Very much. So, I mean, this is the first time running it, and you know, you and I will. I, I already promised you before that I would, we would meet, and I would help you, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, redesign it, reconfigure it in any ways I can yeah. help. Yeah, because I left things untouched, mm -hmm. like. I didn't present the four E the four E cognition sure. model, yeah. but you know I think I should speak about how minds are distributed. Yes, because yes. I believe that um, the sacredness, the gnosis that is emerging from the sessions, cannot be ex the wisdom that is emerging cannot be explained, but by some type of social, neural, scientific. Yeah, it's the collective intelligence of distributed cognition. This is the whole dialectic into dialogos project. Yeah, I think you. Yeah, I, I think you should definitely. You might be. You need an eighth week where there's a dialogical aspect uh, to the wisdom practice. So, first of all, just some feedback. How has it been going? Like, how how's the how's the program been going? What what kind of things are you seeing? Um, in, in the participants, what kind of things are they saying to you? Um, you opened a window 
things mm. in my life that I didn't had before. Uh, I never imagined that there was another way of interacting. Uh, People are using, you know, the mindful conversation techniques, which is basically active meditation. Yes, 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 yes. They are using it because there is a homework between each session and the homework is to practice mindful conversation around a question related to the skill of the week. Oh my gosh. Homework. That's fantastic, yeah. Iris. It's just oh. wonderful. That's why they come back to class with so much knowledge to share with the rest. So that so you're getting like so I've heard similar things where, where like people say, you know, uh, I, I I I didn't know I was always looking for this, or I didn't realize I could this kind of connection or intimacy or or way of seeing was possible. Very very much, and it it, it um. It speaks to the fact that our culture at large has a wisdom famine that is so pronounced that many people don't even realize how much they're starving for it until they get the first taste of it. And then they get the first taste of it. And it's like, <gasps> right? Very, very, very much. That's- Or like, I, I, it seems so much commitment at the beginning because besides having a project, I ask people to commit to the seven classes because right. we are teaching each other, therefore they're gonna be missed if they don't come. Yes. So they are teachers. So this person said, you know, she's in Europe, very busy, high, higher up in a biotech company. And then she came to a class number six and said, This is too short, Iris. <laughs> <laughs> I have to make it longer, Iris. Yeah, yeah. So um so, Another thing is that I was scared at the beginning. Yes. I was scared, no, but concerned that some of the people are in a very diff different spiritual space yes. or theological space. Some of them are two ministers, two healers in right. the class. Uh, and then like five people who are completely secular. Right, and right. right. People who are completely, you know, that they yeah. pray the rosary almost every day. Yeah. And then I even had a meeting with Rick Repetti. Right. Because that was my concern. I'm a secular person, Vipassana, because I have the center nearby and, and I'm a Vipassana right. meditator. And Vipassana meditation plus Daniel Bennett made me a naturalist. Right, right, of course. Of course. And, and I was like, oh my gosh, what's going to happen? And so Rick said uh, to internalize you, <laughs> but if I internalized you, <laughs> nothing bad would happen. And true. I said to him, okay, I'm just gonna call you as soon as I have the first session because I didn't want people fighting for the different stories or the different propositional knowledge they have about this. Right, right. And the problem did not exist. Right, right. Wow, yeah. How come? Well, I think because I, 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 I think the re I think people, I think all of us who are trapped in propositional tyranny, once we get outside of it, we are so awakened to the non-propositional and the cultivation of wisdom and meaning that all those propositional differences pale by comparison in the fact that we are all jointly going. I'm starving for this. I'm starving for this. I'm starving for this. Wonderful. I'm so grateful, John. <laughs> so I didn't great. know you talked to Rick. That's so cool. Uh, that was. <laughs> that, that, I love Rick. I've, I've reached out to him. I'm going to try and get uh, get another conversation with him going uh, soon. He's a. I always call him the amazing Rick Rapetti because th that's what he is. He's he's just like like the breadth and depth of his mind without any sense of arrogance or pretension and just an honest you know desire to communicate deeply with people i just so admire that in him. he's so he's so virtuous in that way and i just i really admire him i'm glad you got to speak with him so i mean so you're finishing up you're getting this amazing feedback from people right so are you are you gonna are you I assume you're going to run this again. Are you are you also planning to like build upon it? Maybe have like after like 
this is the introductory one? Would there be like an intermediate and an advanced or is that in the works? Is that kind of what you're planning or? Yeah, at the end of June, I have one class in English and one class in Spanish. And I already have people registered for both classes. Right. And then during the fall, I want to do an advanced class, which is why I ask for your advice. Sure. What I have done in the past is the follow. Uh, when I was working with Harvard in this model that I created at Tufts that I call the management of learning, how to, because learning is, goes across domains. Yes, yes, and, yes. And I wanted to, I use my cognitive work analysis to understand the work of a teacher. I was teaching at four different universities when I was a, a student at Tufts. And so different students, different te technologies, everything. So I tried to use the cognitive work analysis in my work and that generated the framework that I created that I was able to, to sell across many um, universities. Um, the model that I used for that was an intensive introduction. And then I trained facilitators that they could replicate right. what I taught them. And I wanna do the wisdom project, um, creative commons licenses. So people are free to use it. Oh, because, right, right. because it's really, it's really something really valuable that you can teach any friend of yours how to reason wisely. That's it. Yes, yes, yes. With those seven skills and the tools that I am delivering. So my idea then is to do a few more intros to, so I get the flavor of how to manage Gnosis who is pouring through the room yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's just it's a little overwhelming for a naturalist. Yes, yes I know. I would like I know. to have a sky hook. <laughs> yes, I I know exactly what you're talking about, Iris. I felt that too. When the logo shows up and everything is being swept up, and you're like, and reality seems to be speaking to you. Yes, I know what that's like. I've had that multiple times when I done you know philosophical fellowship or dialectic into dialogos or circling practices, authentic relating. Yes, yes, I know what you're talking about very much. And then what do you do when that happens, when the logo, I don't know if I'm doing it, I, I talk about the logo as the, found, the logos as the foundation and on top of it, I feel like I have like a temple of the wisdom project. The foundation is the logos, on top of it, the floor is gnosis and then there are columns and the skills are inside and the columns are science, story, symbols, and mind tools. Yes. Like Daniel Dennett uses that term, yeah. I use that yeah, term yeah. too. Yeah. Um, but I am like, I am in need perhaps of, sky, of a sky hook. <laughs> Slaughter deck, yeah. The, uh... Sky hook is that uh, Daniel Dennett, the yeah, philosopher yeah. of mind says that, yeah. um, you know, we only have cranes, which is what we have in the world, but some, some of us need sky hooks that basically are supported by nothing. So it's difficult to be a naturalist when the logos interrupts. Yes, as a life of its own. Just so people know, Daniel Dennett is somebody I teach about at the University of Toronto. He's one of the founding, he's a philosopher, but he's definitely one of the founding figures of cognitive science. Um, the, the explanation I give of the frame problem, for those of you who've seen it, is directly from Daniel Dennett's work. Uh, he was one of the people that really made clear uh, the problem, uh, the frame problem, the relevance problem within it. Uh, Daniel Dennett, uh, uh, as Iris said, does a lot of work on things like he calls intuition pumps. And uh, very, he's, he's a very, staunch naturalist. He was, he was one of the four, uh, four horsemen of the new atheism, uh, very important influential thinker. Um, and, uh, but I, 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 I totally get why, um, you know, if you, if you being Dennett's student, you're deeply immersed um, in a naturalistic framework. Yeah, and then um, try uh, re uh, reckoning with, uh, with, with, with what shows up uh, when you're doing these practices in a naturalistic framework is, is, is a challenge. That's a challenge I have been trying to take up and I've been trying my best to bridge 
uh, between a, uh, a, a naturalistic cognitive science, non-reductive naturalistic cognitive science, and spirituality. That's my project. Um, so I, 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 I deeply appreciate um, exactly what you're talking about, Iris. I encounter it frequently, and um, I am, I'm glad that many people such as you and I are willing to encounter it honestly and try to hold on simultaneously both to the science and to the spirituality. I, I, it, it is, first of all, I'm just grateful to meet somebody. There's a fellow, a, a fellow, you know, uh, a, a worker in this area. You and I are, are trying to do the same thing. And we're also trying to turn the theory into actual practice, not just leave it as theory. I, I mean, I, I, that's why I, I just, I just, I, I really, um, I don't know. It's, it's like, uh, it's like, oh, I did. It turns out that you and I are cousins or something like that. It's one of those connections that you start to realize uh, uh, that's so, um, so powerful. Uh, so I, to answer your question, I, I mean, I've been trying to create the conceptual vocabulary, the theoretical grammar, and the enacted gymnastics that will actually allow us to appropriately honor the, you know, the advent of the logos while remaining within a scientific framework that is responsible to the richness and the depth of the, that reality. Um, and so me, um, the, the two easy outs are just to write it off and say, there's nothing going on there. Or just to say, uh, here's my mythological explanation and that's all I need. And it's like for me and for many people in the world today, they, they, don't, they, they don't find either one of those satisfactory. And part of the meaning crisis is our culture says, well, those are the only two choices. It's either it's not really important, that's all just superficial, woo woo, fluff, fluff, or no, it's actually angels and et cetera and stuff like that. Um, I'm sorry, I don't mean any denigration of people who talk about angels, but the point I'm trying to make is I am convinced that for most people who are wrestling with the meaning crisis, a third way has to be offered. And you're clearly trying to do it. And it's more than trying. It clearly sounds like you're succeeding and you're touching people's life. And the fact that you are touching people who come like, like ministers who come from a traditional religious framework, healers who come from an alternative religious framework, and then a bunch of secular people. And the fact that it's working for all of them is maybe one of the most important pieces of evidence that you could bring about this. Pouring through the floor, you know, because I have this temple, is know thyself is in the roof, like a Greek temple, and then the right. column, science right. stories, mind tools and symbols and then the floor is gnosis and the foundation is logos and i feel the logos pouring and my uh -huh. little mind and there is just with little buckets trying to capture <laughs> with words what's happening <laughs> <laughs> and it doesn't work <laughs> so i'm using words like sacred yes 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 and and it's words like grace yes yes Yes. Inviting the participants to modify the wheel of emotions that you can find on the internet for yes. the Center for Nonviolent Communication, where the emotion of wonder, or um, grace, all these expansive things that happen when you connect with that, many times don't appear. So people are finishing up. Um, I'm interested in the last session because I understand, if I've misunderstood you, please correct me. But what you're doing in the last session is like, how do you, how do you take this out of the course, out of the project and transfer it into your life? Am I understanding that? So what are, yeah. what are you doing there or what are you going to be doing in order to try and okay. help you do that? I am, only time I struggle because I call myself the two lady yeah. Because I have so many tools after yes. so many years of doing this type of consulting work. Uh, so I put in, you know, until I have a perfect session, like a two hour perfect, like a, going to a theater, you know, it's like a theater. 
every yeah. it's a performance basically yeah yes yeah, we course. perform we are all you know yeah. um but so far um the, my idea is the following we have been talking about the imaginal self that you right. talk about in your feet number 50 video or something like that about tillage in in corbin yeah yeah we have been talking about the imaginal self and i have been doing little pieces of introduction to experiencing wonder experiencing all you know all this experiencing agapic love right 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 and when they do the mindful conversations the question is what is agapic love for you when they get uh, intrigued right. yeah so i'm cultivating that for the final um uh, session that so far is it's called in psychology it's called um transitional state where you are the current self and you see the the oh. second second the second sacred self but i'm not calling it like that i'm calling it the imaginal self fine and that's fine you, yeah <laughs> and then you journey you journey yeah like you know imagine the god janus it's a contemplation exercise yeah. Yep. Uh, Janus, the Roman god, that one face shows something and the other face yes. shows another yep. thing. This face, the one that is seen, the imaginal self shows wonder, which we have cultivated in our encounters. And this one shows agapic law, unconditional law that we also right. have cultivated. Right, right. And that's what I was thinking of doing until we talked last week and you suggested we do uh, a dialogue around wisdom and i'm now thinking oh, yes or no I'm, I'm... yeah i like the idea of the imaginal future self um I, all the work of for this hirschfield and others that when people enter into an imaginal relationship especially when it's made vivid for their future self they will actually pursue long-term goals um uh they will overcome hyperbolic discounting i talked about that when i was uh uh when i gave my uh, lecture at cambridge did I send you the link to that? Or, or? I, I already saw it before we talked oh, last week. Right, right, right. Yeah, the, the, that, uh, all that. You have a you have a really a good follower on me. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's that's good to know, Iris, and I really appreciate that. Yeah, it's I, so I, helpful. It's so helpful. And now that I see it working with the frameworks that I'm familiar with, um, it's just amazing. Yeah, uh, I yeah. Okay, I, so yeah. imagine you said the imaginal self. Yes, because I'm using what you said about Tillish, and I have a book called Imaginal Love by. Yes. Uh, oh, yeah, by by um oh Chatham Tom, Thomas Chatham. Yes, yes, she's, yes. Yeah, okay, I have that one. Imaginal Love's a great book, and and, and she, Chatham's work, and he, I prefer uh, his work on Corban rather than directly reading Corban. Corban is very, very, very hard to read uh, because he's his his style is very very uh imaginal like it like it's hard to it's often like you'll read it and you, you're trying to figure out why what, 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 what's going on where I, I find that the uh world turned inside out imaginal love and all the world is god's icon um which is very close yeah. to Sebastian Morello's book on aquinas so i might be confusing the two titles uh that trilogy i think is like that is the way of really understanding corban really really well i, I think hey, Corbin, I, I... I bought the books by uh, Shitan. I don't know yeah. how to pronounce his name. Um, and then I'm using that that symbol of the imaginal self. Yes. Uh, and the imaginal project, the imaginal self. And I was planning to close with that. And then you made a suggestion. But also, I want to have a very concrete um, tool that I have used many times called Sprint, where you run a project in X number of weeks, and then you have goals. It's a little thing that is done in software engineering and uh, change management yeah. to make sure that when you set yourself to do something, you have the, the, yeah, yeah, the mind post to do yeah, it. Yeah. yeah. So, so I was gonna combine the imaginal self transitional exercise with that, and now I'm considering your suggestion. Well, maybe we can bring them all together. Here's a suggestion. Um, Go ahead. And and, and this is uh, uh, this is based on an idea, uh, a, a practice that Jordan Peterson used that he got from 
uh, well, he made a, he he might have invented it on his own, but it it it, it overlaps with uh, practices from Stoicism. So you you uh, you get people to enter into an emotionally affective relationship with their imaginal future self. So it's an imaginal state, not just imaginary. They're engaged, they're committed. And then you, you get them to write the reverse narrative. So work, write a story backwards from the imaginal to right now. And then you do the opposite. Here's everything has fallen apart and you, right, your life's in disaster. Uh, enter into a, and then write the narrative backwards. And then here and now, what's, what can you do to imp improve your ability to discern the difference between these two pathways? That's the kind of thing, because the reverse, right? Writing the reverse narrative um, actually helps give people these narrative signposts, which would line up with the, the implementation plans you're talking about. But if you do the two and you bring them together, the, the, the path of foolishness and the path of wisdom, and then you bring, it's like, it's almost like, like uh, the third, the, the perspective of, of perspectival painting, right? And you're bringing it back to them and saying, okay, what do I need to do here right now in order to deepen the skills, the sensibilities, the states of mind, so I can discern the difference between these two pathways and keep discerning the difference so that I can follow this story rather than falling into that story. Wow, you have brought spirituality into springs, which is the technique. Yes. <laughs> well, and, and, and like I said, I, I want to give credit where credit is due. Um, I mean, that's, that's Jordan's, one of his practices he's done. Um, and, and like I said, it doesn't originate with him, although I think it might be original to him. He might have thought of it up on him. I mean, there's ver various versions of this explicitly argued for in like Stoicism. Do you remember the name? Just uh... of the practice. Um, uh, I, 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 what he calls it, I don't remember. I, it might be something. Okay, I'll, I'll find it. It might be something like self-authoring. I'm not sure. I'm not sure what he calls it. Okay. Um, but it, it uh, like I said, if you combine it with the imaginal stuff from Corban and all, all of the good cog side, and then you can bring in, like you said, the, like the thing where you give people, like the, you, you chunk it into uh, uh, appreciable signposts, guide marks, milestones, whatever metaphor you want to use. Milestone, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, That's perfect. It. It's perfect. Yes. Okay, I'll do the, I'll do the wisdom uh, dialogues for the second level. Yes, I think I that's be good. That. And yeah. another thing is that I have not talked about the negative side mm -hmm. because the logos can erupt, you know. I have not talked about what could emerge that could be scary. Yeah, that and that blows I, people up. Yes, and so I am working on the on the premise. I would say that by holding the space, by doing a lot of mindfulness, I can guide the process. But once they leave my care, yes. and my container, I don't think I push. Oh, that's the reason why I use a very mild mindfulness technique. Yes, uh, yes. Uh, Tanya well. Singer. Yeah. yeah. Tanya Singer from the Max Plan Institute. She does, yeah. it's called intersubjective mindfulness. It's very mild, and but it's powerful. Yes. Um, so that's my, my, because I'm so surprised by the logos emerging with so much force. I am considering. Well, I mean, you're also giving them all of these are tools of raising awareness of self-deception and enhancing self-correction that has to be practiced very very deeply um, and that's your those are the primary virtues that people need in order to deal with the emergence of any darkness i mean and then i mean there's things you can work on in the second level uh, stuff you know uh, that i'm working on you know with other people uh, you know there's some Practices around shadow work or doing dealing with projection, um, and then um, there's also things you can do in order to help people improve their internal dialogue. Something you know, variations on internal family systems theory, 
that also can help people process pain um, in, in various ways. Uh, and so the, the, and there, there's some really excellent work uh, uh, being done by Steve March on, uh, in Alethea Coaching, uh, where he has this entire program for taking people into the depths of the psyche and processing a lot of this stuff um, very, very powerfully. Um, so there's a lot, there's a lot, there's a lot we could talk about to, that could potentially go into the, 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 the more advanced course, course too. Um, yeah, at the same time, I have to say that being a person who has practiced many, many different um, psychotechnologies yes. and having found Vipassana 20 years ago, uh, I don't, I don't see why people have to do all that shadow or projection work when the brain at the end is just hallucinating reality. So there is, if I do Jungian psychotherapy or psychodynamic therapy, it's just, it will never end. I don't wanna dismiss any reaction calling it, calling it the shadow or calling it a projection. 98% of what I call the mind is unconscious. So, um, Right, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Can, can the light of awareness burn those defilements and impurities? Um, I mean, for some people, but my experience is um, these practices, because I've taught Vipassana for 15 years, I've taught Tai Chi, right, and Meta, and I agree for most, of, for most people, what you've said is the case. However, I got training in like psychotherapy because every now and then there would be somebody that bumped against some very powerful trauma and they need a much more, they need a practice that is much more specific uh, to their own idiosyncratic, ideographic um, history. Um, and okay. So, I get it. Yeah, so yeah. it's an illusion, it's a naivete to think that, that by just feeding the dynamical system of awe and creativity and aspiration and transformation, I'm going to relegate to basically to extinguish the parasitic processes. So, so that's not, yeah, that's naive. I think it's a little naive. I, I, I don't want, I don't, I, I wouldn't, I, I would, I, I I want to qualify the naivete, if, if that's what I'm attributing to. Um, I think what you're doing will help a lot of people a lot of the time. I don't think, like, I don't think, uh, for example, I would strongly reject or resist any attempt to, tack, to, to take this sapiential project, having to do with, right, that, that you're doing, and trying to reduce it to, a therape to therapeutic models. I would, I reject that totally. So I do not think you can, I do not think therapy does any or most of what we're talking about. So I'm not saying that, but I am saying that you, you, you can bump into some, you can bump into things that in which people have been very seriously hurt in a way in which they have to process it to a point where then these techniques can actually apply to them. Okay, right? that, that I, I agree completely. Yes. yes, 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 yes. And so, um, but I treat it this way. Uh, for, for example, I, I don't necessarily mean projection in that heavy sense. Uh, what I mean is, this is a slogan I use. Uh, what distraction is to meditation, projection is to dialogos. So one of the things that happens in dialogos is people get like equivalently to, like, you know what you, in the past you get distracted from your breath, right? What happens is people get distracted from dialogos, but it's, right? But the distraction usually takes the form of a projection. They often start talking about themselves in the dialectical practice rather than entering into gen, they fall into monologue and then they start projecting their identity on either positively or negatively. Like, oh, yeah, yeah, that's exactly me. Or no, 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 that's exactly the opposite of me. And we try to get people like aware of when they're making those two moves of radical identification or disidentification 
and treat them like distractions. No, no, no. You're 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 leaving the practice, and you're you're right. And so note if you're over identifying or over disidentifying, and try to come back to the center between those. That's what I meant by trying to train people also about uh, things like projection, because it, it's amazing, Iris. Like when 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 Guy Senstock and Christopher Master Pietro and I are doing. Uh, the dialectic into dialogos workshop. We teach them. Uh, that, well, you did it. You know it. You you attended. And uh, uh, and so some of the times, I, I, I not the time you attended. I think the time before. I I went through uh, some of the individual rooms just to help people out. And you remember how often we emphasized when you are the when you are the mindful mirror when you're the try to draw the person out. Don't talk about yourself. You'll be able to talk about yourself when it's your turn. Don't talk. And I go into the room and they're, they're talking about themselves. And I was, no, 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 no. You are, you are playing the role of Socrates. You are asking the questions to draw them out. Stop talking about yourself. That's what I mean when people, and they, and they don't even realize they're doing it. They don't even realize they're doing it. That's what I mean. Things like that. Um, trying to get people a little bit more aware of, as you said, the dark side of this and how it can show up in these practices in ways you're not even aware of. So part of what I was referring to was like trauma, but part of it is also this stuff that people, like in, especially in, 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 in dialogical practices, they need more, like more guidance for how they will fall into these paths. Just like, right, initially when you're doing Vipassana, label the distraction, return to your breath. You, you have to do that for a long time before you then can meditate on the distraction, right? And the same thing. That's what I'm talking about. Okay, I see. Okay, but because I'm not doing therapy, I don't. No, I no, shouldn't and, worry and, about that. No, and I and that and that's a very important thing to say, right? Uh, that, right? You're not doing therapy, and everything we're talking about here is not therapy. Therapy has its place, and sometimes you. Like I've had to point people to therapy as I go and say, you're not ready. You need to go do therapy before you can do this practice, right? And I've done that with people who have entered into meditation because they'll, they'll touch something in a meditation and they will touch, they have PTSD, it turns out, and they touch the trauma. And they're and I said, no, 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 you need to go and you, you have to deal with that because you won't be able to do this. But there, there's definitely that, but we're not doing therapy. We're also not just doing exercise. Like the other metaphor people fall into is, oh, I'm just getting, I'm, I'm, I, you're just making me stronger. You're, you're building my mental muscles so that I can go out. No, no, that's not what we're doing either. We're, we're, doing, we're, doing, we're doing aspiration, like you said. We're, we're seeking transformation. And, and, and getting people to commit to that is, is very important. Uh, I want also to mention that I didn't include insight per se, as a skill to be developed by the seeker of yes. wisdom yeah. reasoning, because the whole uh, performance, the whole session is built around creating flow. Yes, I agree. I don't think there is a specific skill of insight. I think mindfulness and, and other things, insight has to uh, self-organize. If you try to make it happen, there are things, practices of attention and mindfulness and interaction that are conducive to flow, but flow has to flow or it's not Exactly. Flow. Yes. So we create seven sessions of flow yes. where people have, you know, the, as you said, the aha moment. Yeah, yes, yes, yeah, yeah. And One yes. insight after the other. Yes. A trajectory of transframing, as you call oh, it. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, you know, were you close? You know, and then were you close to relevance and then open to moreness? Yes, you know, yes. That's, that's what we have been doing. And that's why insight is not listed there. It doesn't because it's it. everywhere. It's a, exactly, it, 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 that's exactly right. I think that's exactly right. Well, Iris, this is, I mean, we, we are obviously going to talk again. I'm so, I really wanted to help you with, with building the next course. Um, so exciting. Um, I, I, this is one of the gifts of the series is I've been meeting people setting up communities of practices, creating these programs or already having existing programs and trying to integrate it. Um, it's, it, it's, 
it, uh, I was talking to somebody today and I, I'm much more hopeful than I used to be because there's like I, I, people like you, right? We're taking this up and like turning it into an ecology of practice that is meeting people who come from very different perspectives and nevertheless getting them to commune together in a shared commitment to the cultivation of wisdom. I just want to congratulate yeah, you yeah, on that. Yeah. yeah. And uh, before we close, how people end up managing the emergence of religion in their lives. Yes, yes. How people react, like I live, my driveway goes to a church and every Sunday if I have to go out, I feel this pang of this morning of what I was used to when I was growing uh, up. You miss it, <laughs> you're grieving. I even thought of becoming a nun when I was a teenager. Yes, yes. Being trained by the Jesuits. Um, so that that emergence of reverence, revelation, grace that I think you all call, you call all of that religion. Can you say a little more about that and how people manage it? Yes. Um, so for me, I mean, uh, uh, religio. When, when religio is about religio, I, so we're always doing religio. We're always doing relevance realization. We're always doing this fundamental connectedness, right? That's, that's the whole model uh, uh, of, you know, the dynamic coupling to the world. But when, when the religio is done for its own sake, when it's the religio is about the, uh, when a religio is about religio, when it's done for the own sake, and that's what, think about it. You, what is John talking about? Look, salience landscaping, that's one way in which I am an intelligent agent in the world. You know what I can do? I can do salience landscaping for its own sake. And you call that music. And you love music for its own sake. You don't do it to do anything else. You can, you can use music instrumentally, but ultimately you tune it into music instead of music. But when you play the serious play for its own sake, that's when it starts to become sacred. Same thing, uh, you know, I'm making sense with words all day long, but I can take that out and do it for its own sake. And that's called poetry. And then I'm celebrating, right? I'm doing religio for the sake of religio. And I'm starting to get the sense of how the, there's an inexhaustibleness that, uh, the, uh, of intelligibility that is constantly available. So for me, that's why I've been trying to get people to think about the sacred as something that is possible, rational, intellectually respectable, shareable with other people, and that there is an appropriate virtue that we need to cultivate about being in right relationship with the sacred, and that's the virtue of reverence. And I think Woodward's book on reverence is exactly the place to go. It's like, wait, wait, like so you can develop a reverential relationship to celebrations of sacredness, because that's what the, the serious play is, that you can do both individually and collectively. And that is, a, I would argue, a proper way of homing the emergence of spirituality and religion for you. That's, that's, that's exactly what I'm proposing. Indwelling it. Yes, right, and, and, and internalizing it. You indwell it and you internalize it, and right, you, you, the depths of the world call to the depths of the psyche, which call to, call to the depths of the world, which call to the depths of the psyche. Um, and so, yeah, the reciprocal opening that is happening within the experience of sacredness when we enter into it by prioritizing being in right relationship to the sacred, which is reverence. And so um, that's my answer to people. I was like, well, like, get your ecology of practices going, get your community going, and make sure that you have this meta practice of dialectic into dialogos. And make sure you have this meta virtue uh, of reverence in which you are cultivating. I want, I'm, I'm going to do the, I'm going to celebrate sacredness for its own sake, religio for its own sake, and I'm going to have, I'm going to cultivate uh, reverence. I would put it to you, by the way, that reverence is the virtue that we cultivate in response and sense of responsibility to the experiences of wonder and awe. Reverence is how to appropriately right, enter through reverence, through, through awe and wonder into a right relationship with that which always makes wonder and awe possible. 
That's how I would put it. There's no other word for me to say now that now that amen. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, for me, I mean, Layman Pascal and Bruce Alderman and I are talking about this uh, on the integral stage about sort of grieving uh, the death of God and, uh, and what that means. And people who have, especially people who have gone through a, a religious upbringing, but also the culture as a whole is God is receding for the culture as a whole. Um, and so I have spent a large part of my life trying to find a way to satisfy the taste for the transcendence that my mother religion gave me. And it's only now when all of these things are coming together, the ecology of practices, the community of communities, all of this, the awakening, from, it's only now that that taste is now I'm, now, I'm now content, I'm not hungry like I used to. Doesn't mean I'm gonna stop exploring or learning. I hope not, because if that happens, I, I, I should shut up. Uh, but um, I, I hope I always, I aspire to always have the Socratic spirit, but that sort of, it's like, it, this is only meant as an analogy. You really love this person, and the relationship ends. It might, and it might not have ended in, you know, you, the person may have died or they may have moved away or right? it may not have ended in acrimony. It just may have ended. Um, or maybe it ended amicably or whatever. And for a long time, you, you had to, you sort of shaped yourself. And that's what love is. And you think I'll never love again because love is bound to that particular person. But if you properly grieve and, and, you can only grieve by grow. The, you have this hole. And the only way you grieve, grieve I would argue, is you, you just grow around it so the hole is not so big for you. Um, and it becomes something you can look through rather than something that's just an emptiness. Um, but if you grow, you love again. And you realize that it's not the same, but that longing for deep love is possible again. I'm with somebody right now, and, um, and this, this, this is an amazing, this is an amazing relationship. I've had other relationships, but it's exactly that. It's like, I, I, it's like, you can get to a place where, sorry, I have got to a place, and I'm hoping it is the case for other people, where that longing, that right, that Augustine calls it the God-shaped hole is now capable of loving again, um, but in a naturalistic framework. And I'm hoping that's the case for other people and not just idiosyncratic to me, but um, it seems to be, it seems very much to be. Idiosyncratic to you? I hope it's not. I hope it's not. No, it's I hope not. It's yes. not. Yeah. I have been blessed with a second marriage and, um, yeah, it's possible. It is possible. And so we, we can be wedded to the depths of reality um, in a new way again. Um, and that's, that is what I'm, hope, that's what I'm, that's what I'm a, a, aspiring to offer people as best I can. And I'm so grateful that we people like you who are doing the same thing with such authenticity and commitment. I like to give people who are guests on my show uh, the opportunity for the last word before I shut things down. So Iris, is there anything you'd like to say now at the end? Um, well, that I am really grateful for your work and your life and your passion for transcendence because it's pouring opportunities for many people, myself among them and the people that I will touch in the future. So thank you, John. Thank you so much for saying that. That's very kind of you. Iris, and we will, of course, talk again. Thank you so much for being here. Okay, thanks.